Tuesday nights were always a little hectic, especially the second Tuesday of every month. That was my Kanas club meeting, which ran from 6.30 to whenever. May and I didn't get home until 5 o'clock and 5.30, respectively. I didn't have to worry about dinner, as Kanas was a dinner meeting, but there was always some little thing May, my wife of four years, needed done before I could leave. The real problem was my doing, according to May. She was three months pregnant, and her hormones were going crazy. She may have been with child, but she was still the dreamboat I'd married. Now, with the mother-to-be glow about her, it was doubly hard for me to leave her, even for one evening. She was just right, 5 feet 3 inches tall, a well-constructed 110-pound body with light brown hair and incredible blue eyes. Her shape fit me. I loved her for a lot more than her looks. She was funny, smart, and very observant. But her looks sure didn't hurt. Anyway, I had to leave by 6.10 to get to the meeting on time, so I had to run through the shower dress, kiss my wife, and get back in the car to head out. I wasn't usually home until after 11 o'clock, and often it was after midnight. The meeting tonight didn't look to be any different. After the shower, I threw on slacks and a sports shirt, grabbed my briefcase, and headed through the kitchen to the garage. I kissed her on the back of the neck and gave her a squeeze to keep her from falling. She always wobbled when I kissed her on the neck like that, so I had to steady her. Then, out the door into the garage with a rueful glance back at May. It was sure tempting to skip the meeting, not only for May, but also because I had a project in the works in the garage. I was just finishing the installation of a baby monitor for what was going to be the nursery, and I figured maybe 30 minutes and it would be ready to show off to my bride. She was always so appreciative of my small accomplishments, and I felt no qualms in milking her for the compliments. However misdirected, I was a guy, after all, and didn't mind having my woman stroke my ego. Climbing into the car, I activated the garage door opener and started the car. While the engine started purring, I set my briefcase on the seat next to me and checked that I had everything I needed, cell phone, calculator, notebook. All were there. Then I backed out of the garage and down the driveway to the street, waving to May at the kitchen window where she was doing the dishes. She waved back. As I reached the street, before I could put the car in gear or even close the garage door with the remote, the cell phone rang. I stopped everything to answer it. As I said hello, I looked up to wave to May one more time, but she had already disappeared from the window. Gary, came the voice over the phone. Glad I caught you. The meeting tonight is off. Our good President Patrick, along with both Everett and Jules, have been called out of town. So, with the President treasurer, and secretary all gone, we thought it best to call it off this month. Nothing scheduled for tonight unless you have something that can't wait. Needless to say, I was glad to take the night off. I just pulled right back into the garage, noting idly that May's face hadn't reappeared in the kitchen window of our three-bedroom rambler. Yes, she had missed that I hadn't left, so I could surprise her later on. If she had been any place but the kitchen, she wouldn't have heard me drive back into the garage. Once in the garage, I lowered the garage door and then sat in the car, just relaxing for a few minutes. I decided I'd just call out for pizza tonight and not bother May to make my dinner or take the time making it myself. I'd just take the time to get that monitor finished. Everything concerning the camera and the baby's room-to-be was done except for some connections in the garage and final testing. The cosmetics in the nursery were pretty minor. The camera was mounted in a corner and was so small May hadn't yet noticed it, and it had been mounted for ten days now. I'd get those done another time. May had casually mentioned how much a monitor in the nursery would save her steps checking on the baby when it was napping, hence my wiring the house. I decided to set up sound monitors in each of the rooms in the house while I was at it. The visual monitor in the baby's room had been an inspiration when I'd seen some gear a friend was tossing out. The master controls were in her bedroom, but since I spent a fair amount of time in my garage workshop, I had a second master in a corner of the garage, complete with speakers and an old TV subbing as the video monitor. It was flexible enough that the nursery could be monitored from any place in the house. As I mentioned, the whole thing was nearly complete, just needing a little tune-up before I could surprise her and get my plans set. So, I decided to see if I could get the work done before I settled in and collapsed in front of the TV for the night, or maybe I'd collapse on May for the night, that sounded even nicer. I slipped out of my car and began checking my work. 
It took me maybe 20 minutes before everything seemed to be working properly, so I started checking out the sound feeds. Each of them could be turned on and off separately, or I could feed them all into the five second-hand speakers I had lined up above my little corner. I quickly checked each one separately, starting with the living room. They all worked perfectly, actually quite sensitive, because I could hear May taking a shower in the master bedroom's bathroom. I set them up so they were all live and feeding into the garage, then I began the final connections for the video monitor. I got a bit lost in my wiring checks when I heard someone on the living room speaker. It sounded like May was on the telephone. I turned the sound up a bit to see how it worked, and it was perfect, beautifully clear. The $20 I'd spent on the five speakers had been a real bargain. Roger, it's May. If you can be here by 7 o'clock, it's on, lover, came my wife's voice over the speaker. Okay, love, I'll see you then. Don't you dare be late, we won't have nearly enough time as it is. And no, don't figure on getting a repeat. There was a little pause, then May giggled and hung up the phone. What the hell was that about? Who is Roger? Well, the only Roger I knew was Roger Jenkins, his wife Crystal and May had been roommates in college. Crystal was still May's best friend, and Roger and I got along pretty well too. He was a big guy and a lot of fun. I guess he and May had a few dates before Crystal and he hooked up. We spent a lot of evenings together and had enjoyed many a picnic. The two girls were pretty close, May told me they'd done some real crazy things together in college. She calmed me down when she gave me a kiss and told me they hadn't done anything I should be worried about. I shrugged my shoulders, figuring May and Roger were planning something for Crystal, I'd find out at 7 o'clock, which was only 15 minutes away. Giving up the speculation, I flipped on the camera button for the baby's room and sat back with a smile on my face. The monitor showed the room clearly, actually, we still had it set up as a spare bedroom, and the monitor was focused directly on the big queen-sized bed. I was surprised to see the bed made and the sheets turned down, it was the first time I'd seen May make it up when we weren't expecting guests. Checking the video controls, I zoomed the camera in and out. At the widest zoom, I could see everything in the bedroom except into the corner where the camera was fixed near the ceiling. I left it at that setting and critically examined the picture. The door, window, and closet were visible, and the bed, of course, was centered in the shot, and all were clear as a bell. Leaving the controls as they were, I started cleaning up my workbench, feeling pretty good about myself and the sound and picture system I'd made. I pulled a beer out of the old refrigerator and leaned back in my $50 recliner. We'd picked it up at a yard sale, and my wife wouldn't let it in the house, but it fit me in the garage beautifully. Well, I'll admit it fit the garage perfectly. Anyway, I was just about finished with the beer and thinking of ordering some pizza and surprising May when I heard the front doorbell. A second later, I heard the door open and heard May greet the visitor. Hey, I've had a hard time waiting. Come on in, Roger. We have until 10.30, and then it's over, but until then, I'm yours all the way. I was stunned, not by the words, but by the way my wife's voice sounded. The only time I'd heard that husky timbre in her voice was in her bedroom or when we were on our way to the bedroom, it was her doomy baby voice. I choked on the last mouthful of beer and sat bolt upright on the speaker. I heard the front door shut, then May's voice again. Damn, Roger, from the look and feel of this bulge in your pants, I'm not the only one who had a hard time waiting. Um, looks really good. Come here, honey, give me a real hello, I heard Roger say. Then there were several minutes of almost silence, all I could hear were a few grunts and moans. Then, Roger, not here. Come on back to our room. I've got it all set up for us. For May, I thought I was going to be sick to my stomach. It sounded like May was taking him back to our bedroom. Jesus, what was going on? I didn't know what to do. My first impulse was to burst through the door into the kitchen and throw Roger out of the house. Still, what was actually going on? I took a big breath. It couldn't be what it sounded like. May and I were in love. I was sure she had been as faithful to me as I had been to her. She teased me about looking at lovely women, but I knew it was only looking. I'd really never had an impulse to stray. We were compatible lovers, she always had all she wanted when we made love. She was used to multiple climaxes, and I never finished loving her until I was convinced she really didn't need or want more. This had to be a misunderstanding on my part, it had to be. 
She was my best friend. She was going to have my baby. I was just sitting there in the ratty old lounger when my caught movement on the monitor in the baby's room. The door opened, and Maid gently pushed Roger into the room with the made-up bed. She guided him around to the other side of the bed, between the bed and the window. Then she swayed back around to stand on the other side in front of the closed closet doors. She was looking across the bed at Roger, almost right into the camera. May was dressed in her worn-out, ratty old Saturday SLS Sunday morning robe, which reached just mid-thigh. Her hair, however, was pulled up into a sophisticated bun at the top of her head, emphasizing the slender column of her throat. She had applied makeup just the right amount. She looked like a princess receiving her prince, except for the ratty old worn-out robe on her feet. She was wearing the pair of high-heeled slippers I had bought her for her birthday two months ago. She had worn them that evening, and I had told her how they emphasized her magnificent legs, but I didn't remember them being out of her closet since then. No sooner had that thought come to me when I realized I hadn't seen them out of her closet since then. I felt like I was about to cry, this couldn't be happening. My wife stood tall and proud across the bed from one of my best friends, looking directly into his eyes. Her hand slowly came up to the throat of the robe, with her left hand holding the robe closed at the neckline. She used her right hand to unsnap each button, slowly working her way down. Each fastener came loose, and the robe billowed out around her, teasing Roger with glimpses inside. Once she had undone all the buttons while continuing to hold the robe closed, she brought her right hand back to her throat. Using both hands, she slowly peeled the robe open. Once open, she stood for a moment, letting us admire the vision framed by the robe, then let her hands drop, shrugging her shoulders to let the robe drop and puddle around her feet. She was wearing the lingerie I had gifted her on Valentine's Day. She had modeled the set for me then. I had not seen it since. Still looking into Roger's eyes, she held up a hand and crooked a finger at him, ordering him to come to her. When he turned to come around the bed, I saw my former friend's stunned face. He choked out, May, I was expecting to be with you tonight, but you have made this really special for me. God, but you are beautiful. They both got undressed. I suddenly snapped out of my days. No matter how this worked out, I was going to need proof of what was happening. Thinking for a minute, I hurried into the now deserted living room, making as little noise as possible, and working quickly, I got a fresh SD card. I took it back to the garage and hooked it up to the monitor, then turned everything back on. The monitor came alive, showing Roger and my wife. I almost cried, through the tears, I saw them move to the bed, clasping one another tightly. They started going at it, it seemed to go on forever. Roger was driving into her relentlessly. After maybe 15 minutes, she tried to pull away from under Roger. I stared at the sickening scene on the monitor for a few more minutes, then got up and began pacing. I knew if I walked into that house, murder would be done. I was sick to my stomach and totally unable to think of what I should do next. Roger, unless you want Gary to walk in on us, you have to go now, she said. She bent, picked up his clothes, and handed them to him as she gathered the remains of the lingerie she had gifted him, along with herself, placing it on the dresser. I watched as May threw on her old robe and stripped the sheets off the bed, not even waiting for Roger to finish dressing before she bundled them up and took them to the washer in the laundry room between the kitchen and garage. When she walked back into the living room, Roger was there, and with the lilting, bragging voice men often use, he greeted her. Hey, lovely lady, that was great. We really have to talk about doing it again. No, Roger, she answered. I meant it when I said just the once, and only because of our deal and, I guess, for old times' sake too. Sure, honey, I understand. But sometime you may start thinking of us again in the future. This was just for once, I agree. But if you start thinking about how great it was, maybe we can try it again. I heard the sounds of another sloppy kiss before his footsteps seemed to fade as he went to the door. I could hear the impatience in my wife's voice and the little sounds she was making, but it didn't register at the time, nor did the exhalation she made when she finally followed him to the door. Literally sick to my stomach, I lay back in the ratty recliner, looking at the now empty bedroom showing on the monitor. Glancing at my watch, I saw it was 10.37. They had stayed to their time schedule very well. I heard Roger murmuring something at the door and clearly heard May reply, No, Roger, 
This was just the one time and only because of our agreements so many years ago. Gary is my husband, my lover, and the man I want in my life. I'm not sure why we did it now myself. Besides, Crystal may be okay with this, but she's my best friend. She's more important to me than an affair. Isn't she more important to you? I couldn't understand Roger's mumble, but I heard another kiss, and then I heard the door shut quietly. Almost immediately, I heard the lock click home. If I hadn't been so filled with tears and despair, I think the exhaustion sounding in Roger's voice after his session with my wife would have been funny. At the moment, it certainly didn't seem funny at all. After the door shut, May reappeared in the spare bedroom. I couldn't seem to think of it as the baby's room anymore. She quickly went over the room carefully, making sure nothing was missed after the tryst. Gathering up her clothes, she disappeared into the hall, and I soon heard her in her bedroom. I listened to her shower, and then she was out, and I heard the bed rustle. It sounded like my wife had gone to bed. Glancing at my watch again, I saw it was almost 11 o'clock. I just sat and stared into space. I had no idea where my life and my wife were going from here. I only knew I was heartsick. Thoughts and ideas crowded through my head, and some I thought of things which would excuse my wife for what she had done, and others, I answered the excuses. And yet others, I asked myself what I had done to cause May to need another man. Sometime after midnight, I wearily arose and turned the electronics off. Entering the house through the garage door, I headed directly to the master bedroom, passing the spare room where my wife had rendezvoused with Roger. I glanced in, the room was just as I had last seen it Monday evening. The bed was stripped, and nothing seemed out of place, there was nothing to tell that anything had taken place. Groaning to myself, I entered my bedroom. Glancing at my sleeping wife, I went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, and did my business. Stripping off my clothes and leaving them in the dirty clothes hamper before dropping them in, I glanced in, and the hamper was empty, no soiled lingerie there. When I climbed into bed, my wife rolled over and threw an arm over me. She sleepily asked how my night had been. After a moment's silence, I told her it had been very traumatic, but I would tell her about it later. Usually, she snuggled up to me, tonight, however, she just lay quietly, pulling her arm back and rolling over with her back to me. She seemed to fall back asleep immediately, though listening to her breathing, I thought she was still awake. I just rolled away from her and stared into the darkness. I don't know how much I slept that night, I couldn't remember actually sleeping at all. When the alarm went off, I just lay there. I was certainly in no shape to go to work, telling them I think I had the flu. I stayed in bed until I heard her car leave for work. I got up and began carefully opening drawers, being sure not to displace anything as I searched May's dresser. In the bottom drawer, folded and stored in a paper bag and under some sweaters, was the lingerie Roger had enjoyed. I pulled it out, noting the crotch of the ruined panties was still damp. After calling my boss and begging off work for the day, I watched the tape I'd made the night before. When I began, I just skipped through it, not wanting to relive the experience again, just wanting to be certain the tape was good. But after a bit, I began noticing things I had missed the night before. I spent the rest of the morning studying the video and what it held. I made two copies and made two calls. Going home, I realized I hadn't eaten since lunch the day before. I'd missed last night's dinner, and the thought of breakfast this morning had turned my stomach. I didn't have the flu, but my stomach was still very upset. May got home her usual time, about 4.30. When she came in to give me a kiss, I turned my head, and she kissed my cheek, giving me a strange look. Finally, about 5.30, I decided there was no real reason to put this off any longer. May, I'd like to show you what I've been doing for the baby monitor we were talking about. Do you have a few minutes? I asked. Gary, can you wait until after dinner? I'm just about to put it on, was her answer. Picking up my cell phone, I asked her what she wanted to eat tonight. She smiled at me and suggested Chinese, so I ordered it delivered. Then I took her into the bedroom and showed her again how the controls worked on the console in the corner behind the door. I turned on the sound and left her there while I went from room to room, talking to her over the monitor. Of course, she couldn't answer me, but when I got back to the bedroom, the smile on her face told me she understood. It was working better than we had planned. Turning on the video portion, I told her to wait and watch a moment. 
Leaving her in the bedroom, I stepped into the spare room and stood where she had stood last night. Their eyes gazed and pondered a slow bump and grind before I returned to our bedroom. She enthused, Gary, that's perfect. When did you get this going? This afternoon, actually, May. I got it going last night, I answered. She had a puzzled little smile, and I could see she was trying to figure out when I'd had a chance to do it. Like last night? One more thing to show you, May. I took her hand and led her to the garage. I spent a lot of time here and thought it a good idea to have a monitoring station to cover the baby when you have to go out. Then I turned the system on in the garage. One thing I added last night. Let me show you how it works. I slipped the USB drive into the TV. Watch the bedroom and see what happens, I told her. Watching the monitor, of course, we saw the same view as from our bedroom, the empty room I had first seen last night, though now the bed was unmade. Then I used the remote to turn on the TV, and the picture immediately changed to show me on her knees before Roger. Glancing at her face, I saw the color had drained from it, and she seemed to sway before catching her balance. She looked suddenly at me, and I just looked in her eyes and pushed fast forward, stopping in just a couple of seconds. Then I gestured to her to watch the screen again. When she looked back, she saw Roger grabbing at her panties. There was no sound, but we could see May say something to him. We both watched and then heard the small scream she gave, which I now realized was pain. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw tears running down May's face and also saw the little cringe when she saw again the rough way Roger had driven himself into her. Stopping the video, I asked if she wanted to see more. My wife just looked helplessly at me. Come into the house now, May. I think we have a lot to talk about, and I don't know where this is going. With that, I led her into the kitchen, where I sat her at the kitchen table and then sat down at the end of the table next to her. I. I can explain, May mumbled while tears ran down her face. That's what I need, an explanation, I answered. What is the explanation, Gary? This goes back to college and a promise I made one night to Roger. How many years ago did you promise yourself, May? I asked. No, Gary, it wasn't like that. We were both drunk. Roger and I had been dating, he and I were an item. He was a hunk, and I liked him. For a while, I was wondering if he was the one. Everyone thought we were, but I didn't want to commit, and he never really pushed for us to be intimate, though he had a real reputation as a lady killer. I started rooming with Crystal, and they began dating. For a while, he was going out with both of us, though I guess Crystal and he ended up in bed soon after he started taking her out. Nothing serious for Roger and I, but Crystal and he were heading toward where they are now. Roger had an interesting reputation among the co-eds until I came along. There was a lot of competition to get a one-night stand with him, and he was supposed to be pretty special in bed. I wasn't a virgin, I told you that, but I was pretty particular about handing out my favors. One night, Roger and I were sitting around in my room, sharing a few drinks while waiting for Crystal to come back from whatever she was doing. We started talking, and as we drank, we both got more and more risque. Somehow, in our conversation, I told Roger that the only reason he and I hadn't been intimate was my fear of getting pregnant. That wasn't really the only reason, but it was one I could give him, and he had turned me on pretty hard on occasion. Roger was famous for not using a condom, he expected his partners to be on the pill. I don't know how, but somehow, I told him if there were no chance of him getting me pregnant, I would let him have me. He kind of sneered at me and told me something like, yeah, sure. Anyway, we got to arguing, and after a while, I got a piece of paper and wrote a promissory note. I told him that if I could be sure he couldn't get me pregnant, I'd spend an evening in bed with him. When she paused, I was just staring incredulously at her. How long ago was this? I asked. About six years, was her answer. May went on to tell me that the note was one of the jokes between Roger and her. Ever since, then we broke the news of her pregnancy to Roger and Crystal two weeks ago, and after the initial congratulations, Roger and I had gone into their garage to look at a problem he was having. Once I was out of the room, Crystal had looked her in the eye and told her the promissory note must now be due. May had been shocked that Crystal even knew about it and stunned to discover that Crystal was taking it seriously. When Roger and I came in, I remembered a case of Dutch beer I had been going to bring to the cookout, 
insisting it would only take a few minutes to get something special. I left the other three there and went home alone to pick up the beer while I was gone. Crystal had raised the topic of the note again. May was surprised again to find that Roger had apparently believed the note was going to be honored. He was quite indignant to hear May was thinking of welshing on the agreement. This was all taking place after three hours of steady drinking, the last she would have until our baby finished breastfeeding. May had found herself agreeing to honor the old note before I returned. It had been decided between the three of them that she would entertain Roger last night. May, that's one of the strangest stories I've ever heard, and it's really hard for me to accept. I have to ask this, who is the father of the baby you were carrying? May shrank, and tears began falling down her cheeks again. How many other notes are now outstanding, and how many have you paid up on, was my next question. May screamed at me, none, Gary. Don't, I love you, Gary. This happened, it is the only time. It can't happen again, please, Gary, listen to me. She felt her knees, crying, covering her face with her hands. May, please, can I ask you some questions? Will you be honest with me? Yes, Gary, ask me. I'll tell you. This was a one-time thing and not something I wanted to do. My doing it seems incredible to me now, but you are worth more to me than life. I looked down at where she knelt before me. My heart was crying, and my stomach hurt. This was my best friend, the person I wanted beside me all the rest of my life. But I had to know if this person was who I thought she was. May, could you have said no to this? Yes, yes, I could have. But I felt my honor was involved. I was afraid to tell you, afraid you wouldn't understand. But I felt that if you were in my place, you would do the same thing. When the agreement was made, I was drunk. But when I was sober, I didn't throw it out. And when it was made, I didn't know you. It was not something I did to cheat on you, it was something I promised to a friend so dear at the time. In that place, it was right. Thinking for a moment, I replied, so you could have said no after you sobered up, but you felt it was right, something you owed your friend at the time. In these many years later, you felt you still owed the debt to the man your friend of the time had become. Is that right? Yes, she answered. May thought carefully, was this something you were looking forward to? No, she shouted. After a while, I began thinking it wasn't real after all, but just a joke. But it wasn't a joke, it was real. Looking carefully into her eyes, I asked, what about over the past two weeks? Were you looking forward to this? May took a deep breath and answered, no, love, I wasn't. It was something I felt I had to do, it was an obligation, not a pleasure. I just continued looking at her. May looked down at the table. She whispered, Okay, yes, Gary. I guess I was looking forward to it, but not like you're thinking. I've never even thought of cheating on you, never wanted to. But all of a sudden, this was there. I felt I had to go through with it, and if I did, I saw no reason I shouldn't enjoy it. I never felt it was something I had to do because you were not enough for me. It was something I had to honor so I rationalized that I might as well make it special because nothing like it would ever happen again. Taking a great, shuddering breath, I let it out slowly. May, about six weeks ago, I called you on my cell phone while I was driving back from that conference. Remember, we teased for a few minutes, and then I asked if you wanted to meet me at the Holiday Inn in Akron? I asked you to come, and we could make a weekend together, away from home, maybe do some hanky-panky. I think I actually used those words. Do you remember? Sure, Gary, it was a great weekend too, she answered with a tremulous little smile. Did you want to make that a great weekend for us, for me? I asked. What a question. Of course I did, and it was. We had a great time. She gave me a real smile this time. Do you remember what you packed to take with you for that weekend, honey? I asked. Well, not really. I took a nice dress in case we wanted to go dancing, and we did, and some comfortable clothes to walk. Just a minute, girl. I have to turn the video on again to let you understand what this question is about, and I turned and walked back to our bedroom. Partway down the hall, I turned to make sure she was following me, and she was. Once there, I turned on the bedroom TV, hit play on the remote, and it opened with me still kneeling before Roger. She stood up and turned to the bed 
which had her standing facing directly into the camera in the corner, which was taping her shame. May, what in the world are you wearing there? I asked. She blushed and answered, my white lingerie, yeah, the set I got for Valentine's Day. Do you realize you have never worn it for me except to model it when I gave it to you? Well, sure, Gary, but there's been no place to do so. She suddenly stopped, looking confused. Well, you sure didn't wear it at the Holiday Inn. I sure would have remembered. As I recall, you had gone home and changed into a peasant skirt and white blouse, the one that buttoned to the neck. When you got around to taking those off, which was after dinner when we decided to go dancing, you were wearing the white cotton panties and the bra I think you probably have on now. Do you remember what you wore to bed that night after we came back from dancing? In a little voice, she answered, my Donald Duck t-shirt. Looking her in the eye, I asked, May, you just told me the holiday and weekend was special, and the date with Roger wasn't. Yet, you wore about the sexiest thing you own, something I bought for us to share, for Roger but not for me. What does that say to you? What does it shout to me? How special do you think you are placing me? May just looked at me, her shoulders slumping a little. Honey, I continued, if I didn't love you, we wouldn't be living in this house together. If I didn't think you were something special to me, I would not be married to you. But I get an unexpected telephone call that calls off my meeting last night and fall into one of the worst nightmares I could conceive of. Roger, one of my best friends, if not my very best friend, shows up when I should have been in my meeting. He is met at the door by my woman. She takes him back to a room she has gone to some trouble preparing for a tryst, and then gives him a damn good strip. And I see she has dressed her body to display something she hasn't done for me in well over a year. When I ask her about it, she says this meeting was important to her, but she has gone to a lot of trouble dressing, putting up her hair, and applying makeup, things she hasn't done for me since Hector was a pup. That tells me this meeting was very important to her. She considered it a treat that she had to prepare for. It also tells me that her time with me was very ordinary and of much lesser value. She wanted to treat the man, my friend, but she had no interest in treating me, her husband and partner. I saw you doing things for Roger that you only do for me on special occasions, if then, and doing some things for him that you have refused to do with him for me. My wife blinked tears out of her eyes. Gary, it wasn't that way, it really wasn't. I love you, you are special to me. What can I do to convince you? I sat on the bed and just looked at her. I don't know just yet, May. I don't know what we can do, but I'm calling Roger and Crystal and asking them to come over tonight. From what you said, Crystal is already aware of what was going on. I looked at her a moment longer. Do you know if Roger and Crystal had anything else on their minds when this was set up? May shook her head no, and I dialed their number. Crystal answered, and I asked if she and her husband could come over for a few minutes this evening. While I was talking, May answered the door and collected the Chinese food we had ordered. Neither one of us was hungry, but I forced myself to eat. I knew this was going to be a long night, and the emotions had just begun. May just sat and toyed with her food. I almost began to believe her when she told me again she loved me and this was just a one-time thing. It was maybe 7.15 when the doorbell rang. Before I opened the door, I told May I believed there was more to this than she understood. When I opened the door to let Roger and Crystal in, they both gave me a smile, but I don't think it was my imagination that each of them gave May a little special smile. Roger especially, his look at my wife was almost proprietary, and I noticed May cringed a little when she saw it. Sitting them down on the couch, I asked May to sit also and pointed to the couch beside Crystal. She chose instead to sit in a recliner to the side of the couch Crystal was sitting on. I kind of hemmed and hawed for a bit, rambling on about several things, but I included the new monitoring system which I had been working on. I didn't tell them it was working or what it had shown me last night. Crystal and Roger were looking pretty puzzled, wondering why I had asked them over. Finally, I asked them if they would like a drink, joking that I'd better get into my problem or my audience was going to walk out on me. Everyone said yes to the drink, so I fixed one for everyone. We had been friends for so long I knew what each would want this time in the evening and in this situation. Handing Crystal her white wine, I gave Roger his Jack Daniels and 7-Up, what a waste of good liquor. I handed May the orange juice she wanted because of her pregnancy and took what looked like my gin and tonic over to the TV. Actually, it was straight tonic tonight. 
I needed to have everyone about me that I had left, sitting on the hassock with my knees spread, my knees resting on them, and both hands hanging down between my knees cradling my drink, I looked around at each of them. Finally looking at Crystal, I asked, what was in it for you, Crystal? I don't quite understand. She looked puzzled then asked, what was what, Gary? What are you talking about? Last night, girl, why did you work so hard to set it up? Just as I finished talking, Roger sputtered and choked on the drink he had just taken. I looked at him. Roger, I know what you got from it, but was that all? Seems to me there must be more. I tried to look at both women at once, switching my eyes back and forth. Roger, I know your reputation as a playboy. One more notch doesn't seem worth it, particularly with what I think you were risking. Why, Roger, uh, Gary, uh, what are you talking about? He stumbled out to me. Well, you see guys, I was home last night, the conference was called off, and I was in the garage when you made your appointment with May. And when you came in the door, let me show you something. Here I flipped on the TV, standing beside me, the picture that came up was live from the camera in the spare room. I was just completing hooking this up when you came over last night. Pretty good picture, isn't it? May had her face buried in her hands, and Roger's face went pale. Crystal just looked at me with this little, sexy smile. So guys, what was this all about? I continued. Crystal crossed her legs, and one foot began bouncing up and down a little. What do you think it meant, Gary? She asked. Well, Crystal, I answered, you know you have a bit of a reputation too. Actually, it goes along with Rogers. You folks have been pretty straight with us, but I've had a couple of comments at the Kawas. I was pretty glad you folks hadn't said anything to us, but I'm guessing that's about to change right now, right Crystal? Well, this wasn't exactly the way we wanted to bring it up, but yeah, I think you may be right, was her reply. I looked over at my puzzled wife. May, up to now I thought you were aware of this. Now I'm not so sure. Your friend and her husband, Roger here, have been in a kind of key club the past couple of years. I. I don't know how often, but every once in a while, a group of them gets together on a Friday night. They meet in a back room at Barney's Broiler for dinner, and every couple brings one of their house keys hanging on a tag with their address on it. As they come in the back room at Barney's, they drop the key in a big barrel. It's kind of like the one you see at bingo games. After a nice dinner, and since the husbands and wives have driven separately, the wives all leave and drive to their own homes. The gals get home and get ready for some action. Something with a guy they aren't used to, and who can probably get them off better than the same old meat they have at home every night. After they've gone, the guys get to draw out a key. As I understand the rules, each guy gets to look at the address. If it's his own address, he holds it in his left hand and pulls out another key. Then drops his wife's key back into the barrel. I understand some guys will check out an address, and if it's with some gal they had sex with recently or one they don't like for whatever reason, they will draw another key. But they can only draw twice. If they pull their wife's key the second time, they're out of luck. And I understand some guys have really gotten in the soup for showing up to bonk their own wife when she was expecting action. Anyway, then the guys all have a drink before heading off to their rendezvous for the weekend. Yeah, honey, it is for the whole weekend, not just a couple of hours or a night. I've had a couple of comments from some of the Kawas wondering when I was going to join, since we were so close with Crystal and Roger. Everyone involved with the key club thought we were swapping with them on the side. A lot of the other guys wanted to get into your pants. It wasn't just Roger here. The room was pretty quiet, and I looked at each of my companions carefully. May was gaping at me clearly surprised and shocked at what I had just told her. Her eyes were huge. Crystal was giving me this little simpering smile, and her foot was bouncing a lot harder. Roger was looking smug and a bit relieved after hearing my description. Honey, I began, looking at me again, before we go any further, I think you should know something about your last night's lover. May's face went white again at my description. She clearly didn't want to be reminded just how precarious our marriage was at the moment. As you saw last night, Roger is pretty well endowed here. May's face went completely red, and she buried her face in her hands again. Looking over at Roger, that smug look was permanent along with one of the biggest eating grins I'd ever seen. 
the look he was giving me was one of condescension, but I figured to get rid of that before the night was over. Roger is the prize at these drawings, I understand. All the wives hold their breath, waiting to see if they have drawn the real blue-blooded stud, bow for the weekend, just like you described for the co-eds in your college. Looking at everyone's face one more time, I added, so you see, May, you've already tasted the best. Roger was smirking at me, and when I looked at Crystal, she was smirking at May. May just seemed to be sinking into her chair, looking at me a little sickly. I just leaned back a bit on my hassock, then took a long drink of my tonic, pretty bitter, but that's what my mouth tasted like. Anyway, then I just sat and let the silence build. Roger was still looking very satisfied with himself, but it looked to me like Crystal wanted to say something. I just kept quiet and let the tension build some more. Gary, Crystal finally started, it's a pretty good deal, and all we do is add a bit of spice to the marriage. After all, we all get stale and tired of one another after a while. All we need to do is add some spice to keep the love and marriage going. Ask lover man here, he hasn't lost any interest in me, and I think we've added some nice variations to our lives this way. Isn't that right, Roger? Roger just grinned his usual grin. She continued, anyway, we thought showing you that loosening up a bit wouldn't break you up, on the contrary, it would give you both a boost. I'm pretty sure it will bring you closer. Your friendship won't be affected, and I know you can use some new ideas for the bedroom. No pressure on you folks, just think about it. We'll be here when you make up your minds. This was the introduction and, in a way, the confession I had been hoping for, keeping my voice as quiet and steady as I could, I answered, well, Crystal, I appreciate your patience with me. I haven't discussed this with myself, and I doubt I will. I'm not interested in swapping or, as I was telling May this evening, finding another sex partner. My wife and I are intelligent, well-read, imaginative people, we don't need to experiment to improve our sex life. I believe we'll enjoy our life together for many more years, God willing. The last thing I need to address bothers me because it might sound like I'm punishing May. That's not my intention at all. But, as you've mentioned several times today, Roger doesn't practice safe sex. I don't know the medical conditions of his numerous partners, and frankly, I don't want to. What I do know is that you're now carrying our child. You'll have to visit your doctor and come up with a story about why you need to be tested for STDs. This will hurt both of us. We can't have sex until you've been tested and cleared. We can't risk passing something between us. Do you understand? Honey, I continued, looking over at our bewildered best friends, I feel betrayed by both of you. I'm not sure whom I'm angrier at, but regardless, we'll have to put a hold on getting together for the foreseeable future. I turned off the TV, ejected the USB drive, and handed it to May. She grabbed today's newspaper from the end table, crumpled up several sheets, placed them in the fireplace, and lit a match. After adding the drive to the pile, she and I watched the fire smolder and eventually consume the contents. When I turned around, both Roger and Crystal were fast asleep. Well, the chemical worked, I muttered, making a phone call. Hey, Lopez, your package is ready. Three hours later, at 11 p.m., my doorbell rang. I opened the door and welcomed Lopez. You have something for me? I asked. I pointed to the two unconscious bodies in my room. Lopez went back out and returned with seven more men. They picked up Crystal, but as they moved toward Roger, I asked them to stop. I went upstairs and returned with a baseball bat. I just need a few swings, I said. Lopez smiled and put Roger on the ground. I know where to hit, I told him, aiming for the kneecaps, ankles, and family jewels. It was over in a few swift moves. May stood there, mouth agape. I wish you were awake, I wanted to hear him scream. He's all yours, I said, nodding to Lopez. They picked him up and carried him out. Five minutes later, Lopez returned and sat with me. Thanks for the samples. We needed them. My pleasure, I replied. May was still sitting, stunned. After Lopez left, the night air cold around us, May approached me. What happens to them? They're going to Mexico. There, they have medical students who need practice samples. My voice was cold and flat. What if someone comes looking for them? She asked. Lopez will take care of that. 
You killed them. How can you be so heartless? You broke my heart and didn't care how I'd feel. You have no right to judge me. If you think you can go to the cops and turn me in, go ahead. But I made sure they're useful to society. May shook her head. You said we'd get back together and have sex. I lied, I said bluntly. Here's what will happen. Tomorrow morning, we'll get a DNA test for the unborn child. We'll wait for the results. If I'm the father, I'll help with the birth. However, we won't stay married. You won't take any lovers until my son is 10 years old. If you do, I'll make sure you're very useful. Tomorrow evening, we'll walk to the divorce lawyer and file for divorce. You can have the house, and I'll provide support until you find a job. Do I make myself clear? May nodded silently. I never knew you were like this, she whispered. Neither did I, I replied. The next day, we filed for divorce. Three weeks later, we got the DNA report, it was my child. Four months later, we were divorced. Two months after that, my son was born. I spent a lot of time with him. May and I met and talked, but I could never love her again. She never took another lover, and I supported her for the next five years until my son could take care of himself. I never dated, and all my energy is solely for my son. And yes, Lopez did send me a big thank you gift. No one came looking for the two samples I had sent. Story 2 I had a peaceful life, everything was like that of ordinary people. Wife, child, job. We had been living together for a long time, and there were no unusual problems or incidents. Many of our friends and acquaintances went through various family battles, infidelity, quarrels, and many other unpleasant moments. Some divorced, while others had married or remarried several times. For us, however, everything was different. We lived calmly and harmoniously. Of course, it wasn't always smooth, but we always found a way out together from any situation. I always trusted my wife and never doubted her loyalty. It seemed to me that this was my lifelong love, and lately, I took it for granted. I thought, like many others, it can happen to anyone, just not to me. I worked in the paint industry. My task was to negotiate contracts with other companies for the supply of our products. Therefore, I often went on business trips. It was a challenging job. Business trips were exhausting, but they brought in a good stable income. My wife, Mindy, also had a challenging job. Her work was somewhat similar to mine, involving pharmaceuticals. Mindy dealt with processing orders that were sent to various clinics and dental offices. We had a son, David, who was already 26 years old. Raising our son was not easy. Despite our demanding work schedules, we tried to dedicate maximum attention to our child. My parents, who lived nearby, also helped us with this. And we raised a wonderful son, he was my pride. He excelled in his studies and had found an excellent job in a bank. David was confidently climbing the career ladder, and now he lived on his own. And Mindy and I lived in our cozy little house together. I inherited this house from my Uncle Thomas. Thomas didn't want to sell the house, he hoped to return here someday, so he asked us to live in it. Thomas never managed to start his own family, but he treated me like a son. That's why he entrusted me with his house. But over the years, Thomas never came back here. Our life continued smoothly, without major problems. When we were together, we always found time to spend it together. We went to restaurants, took trips into nature. I didn't want to change anything in my life because everything was already wonderful. But soon, everything changed. It all started after one of my business trips. I met with my friend Richard. He was an old friend from university. We occasionally met to have a couple of beers. This time, he surprised me. He began cautiously asking about our relationship with Mindy. He said it wasn't his business but decided to tell me what he saw. He happened to pass by our house and decided to drop in, not knowing I was on a business trip. No one expected his visit. At home were Mindy and Albert. Albert was our family dentist. He was already quite elderly. We got along well, but it was indeed strange for him to be at our house. Then Richard told me that he also saw them in a restaurant, just the two of them. I told him that it was definitely not what he thought. 
This couldn't possibly happen. Albert was not of the right age, and he had his own family, which he often talked about. I didn't believe that there was anything between Albert and Mindy. But still, a small doubt crept into me. Later, I noticed that Mindy really started going to Albert's dental office frequently. And I decided to talk to her. Dear, I wanted to talk to you, I said. Yes, Michael, what happened? I noticed that you've been going to Albert quite often. Do you have any serious problems? Are you talking about that? I just want to improve my smile. I've seen that many people do it nowadays. The results are simply amazing. So, I go for consultations, take x-rays, and Albert advises on how to enhance it without causing harm. Darling, why do you need this? Your smile is fantastic. You don't need to change anything. It's clearly unnecessary. Michael, I'm still thinking about it. Let's see what can be done and how painful it will be. I understand, Mindy. Tell me, is it just about this? Well, of course. What else could it be? Tell me, did he come to our house, or did you discuss your teeth in the restaurant too? Now I understand everything. Richard told you everything. I saw him. I hope you didn't think anything bad. I was just bored, so I went to dinner with him for company. I wanted to be in a public place, and I didn't want to go alone. I learned that Albert also likes to go to restaurants. He didn't mind going with me. His wife knows about it, she's in another city now. So, nothing terrible happened, we just had dinner as old acquaintances. He came to my house a couple of times, and we had coffee. That's all. Sorry for not telling you right away, I just didn't think it would bother you. Okay, Mindy, I trust you. It's just a bit strange. You always used to wait for me, and now I hear such news. It worried me a little. Michael, don't worry. Silly, did you really get jealous of Albert? I respect and love Albert, but only as a friend. Believe me, old men are not my type. I have one man whom I love, and that's you. Talking to Mindy calmed me down. I genuinely thought it was complete nonsense. After all, we had lived together for so many years, and there was no reason to doubt or hide anything from each other. I tried not to take it seriously. But I began to notice that Mindy was acting strangely. And I couldn't understand what could be causing it. I saw that Mindy was trying to maintain her usual lifestyle, but sometimes she would come home late from work or be somewhere else. I noticed her mood swings. She could be insanely happy one moment and then sad and silent the next. Meanwhile, she began texting someone frequently on her phone. I asked her about her strange behavior, but Mindy always found a clever explanation. She said she was now interested in world news, delving into it, so she often read the latest news on her phone. Gradually, all of this began to unsettle me. I knew she continued to see Albert, but she insisted that there was nothing serious about it. I tried to continue trusting her. But with each passing day, it became harder and harder to do so. I truly began to worry. Thoughts crossed my mind. What if she really got too close to Albert? Yes, I knew Albert well, and earlier, I would never have thought of such a thing. But now everything had changed. Of course, the man was already elderly, but what if that didn't stop him from getting close to my wife? These thoughts became very burdensome. I couldn't think about anything else. But what was I to do about it? I wasn't going to spy on my wife. It seemed silly to me, and I wasn't a boy anymore to resort to such actions. But I continued to observe strange things. I saw Albert's car near our yard. Mindy said he just gave her a ride home sometimes. I saw that she had no intention of telling me anything, even if she was hiding something. I noticed that every such conversation only led to her anger. She accused me of excessive suspicion, saying that I had changed. I found myself in a dead-end situation. But after some time, I finally decided on an action that might help me. I decided to talk directly to Albert. I had to get to the bottom of this once and for all. I decided to talk to him when Mindy was busy at work. She was about to leave for a conference for a couple of days in another city. Mindy was supposed to leave closer to the evening. I was at home at that time, patiently waiting for Mindy to leave. 
Closer to the evening, Mindy bid me farewell and left in a taxi. I began to prepare myself as well. I decided to make my visit unexpectedly so that Albert wouldn't have any excuses. I had to talk to him today. I got into the car and drove to Albert's dental clinic. He was still supposed to be at work. But I was still worried that I might not catch him there during work hours. However, when I arrived, I sighed with relief. Albert was still at work, his car was parked there. I sighed with relief and parked nearby. I climbed the steps to the glowing entrance. There was still a receptionist inside. I approached her and said I would go to Albert. But the receptionist stopped me. She said he was no longer at work. I looked at her in surprise and mentioned that Albert's car was still here. The receptionist said she knew nothing about it. I began to try to go anyway, arguing that maybe he was still here. But the receptionist sternly repeated to me that Albert had already left and would only be back tomorrow. I was bewildered, slowly making my way towards the exit, not fully grasping what was happening. How could this be? He should be there. What nonsense was this? Doubts began to creep in. As I approached the exit, I noticed that the receptionist had left her desk and gone somewhere. At that moment, I abruptly turned around and headed for Albert's office. I entered the room, and the door was unlocked. The light was on, but no one was there. It was strange. Something was definitely not right here. I looked around and was about to leave, but suddenly, my eyes caught sight of a coat on the hanger exactly like my wife's. My heart started beating faster. Then I heard something happening in the adjacent room. I approached the door in horror, trying to open it, but it was locked. Emotions boiled inside me. Anger filled me. I stepped back a little and kicked the door with my foot. What I saw shocked me. The receptionist had not lied. Albert was indeed not here. But I saw something I could never have expected. And it left me stunned. I saw my wife lying on the table, legs spread wide, being intimate with a much younger guy. You bastards, what the hell are you doing? I shouted and shoved the guy against the wall. While the guy tried to gather himself, I grabbed a syringe with a needle from the shelf, removed the cap, then lifted the young man, pressed him against the wall, and aimed the syringe with the needle at his eye. I'm going to poke your eye right now, you bastard. I yelled. Mr. Michael, please don't do this. It's a mistake, I'm guilty. I'm just an intern, don't do this. I beg you. With a trembling hand, I held the needle near his eye. The guy was shaking and begging me to stop. The needle had already scratched his eyelid, and blood started to fill his eye. He continued to tell me everything about himself. His name was Jacob, he was interning with Albert, who happened to be his uncle. Albert had lent him his car for a while. And this bastard was giving my wife rides, having intimate moments with her everywhere. These words sent me into a rage. And Mindy, shocked and frightened, covered her nudity, trembling and just staring. Mindy, you monster, how could you do this? So, the old man is not to your taste anymore, and even your husband no longer fits the bill, but this little bastard, barely in his twenties, suits you just right. Right? You're silent, have nothing to say? Michael, please forgive me. I don't know what to say. I'm ashamed. I just didn't think. Were you not ashamed when you were fooling around with this bastard? And now you're ashamed? Monster. Now everything is clear to me. All this time, you lied to me, made a fool out of me. What a bitch you are. You betrayed everything we had. I could never have thought of such a thing. Forgive me. Michael, forgive. That's enough for me. Do whatever you want now. I no longer want to be a part of this. Mindy, I'm filing for divorce. I declared and threw the syringe away. I left there very angry. I was in shock from what I saw. I didn't even know where to go or what to do. I sat in the car and rested my head on the steering wheel. Then I exploded in anger and started hitting the headrest on the adjacent seat with my hand. After that, I spent the whole night drinking and packing all of Mindy's things into large black garbage bags. I didn't want even the smallest reminder of her. When I had gathered all her things, I set up a huge bonfire in the yard. 
After some time, I finally came to my senses. I was seriously determined to divorce Mindy. She didn't want to do it, but I was firm in my decision. I pursued it. Then Mindy's agony began, and she tried to retaliate against me for not forgiving her. She actively started a legal battle with me. But I had a very good lawyer specialized in divorce cases. It ended with Mindy only getting what was rightfully hers. She tried to take away my house, but it wasn't our home. According to the documents, it still belonged to my Uncle Thomas. So she couldn't leave me without any property. Despite lengthy legal proceedings, I successfully completed the divorce. She was very upset that she couldn't get anything from me. And I gave her the middle finger on the way out of the courtroom. Now I needed to focus on the future because life goes on. It was hard to start life anew. But I really wanted to forget everything and move on. After some time, I learned that Mindy had contracted some illness. It was a pretty serious cancer, and Mindy was dying. No one could help her. I thought about it, I felt sorry for her. Yes, she betrayed me, but I didn't wish her death. I realized it was probably her karma punishing her. But I'm a human being, and it's not in my nature to leave a person in distress. A lot of people would probably judge me, but I couldn't do otherwise. I decided that such an act would allow me to let go of the past and peacefully continue my life. I decided to forgive Mindy. I had a friend, a very good doctor, Kevin. We knew each other since childhood, but we hadn't talked for a long time. I knew he was a leading diagnostician, and it was tough to get through to him, but I tried. Kevin was glad to hear from me, and he said he would try to help. After some time, Kevin managed to find out what illness was killing Mindy. The correct diagnosis and treatment allowed Mindy to start recovering. She cried when she saw me. She thanked and apologized at the same time. I talked to her. And we decided to part ways amicably, now each of us would have a new life. Mindy agreed. Mindy recovered, and at first, everything was fine. But then I learned that Mindy got hooked on drugs. Her lifestyle was terrible. She decided to ignore the second chance at a new life. I don't know what led to this, new acquaintances or just a radical decision to change her life. But it was a crooked path. After some time, I learned that Mindy had passed away. Her heart couldn't take it. Doctors couldn't save her. I felt sorry for Mindy, but she chose such a life herself. Albert somehow came to me on his own. He was ashamed, and he didn't know what Jacob was up to. He said he had kicked him out. Jacob forged prescriptions and prescribed narcotics. He was a drug addict. He dropped out of school and soon found himself on the prison bench for an unsuccessful attempted theft. This young man ruined his life. A huge prison term awaited him, and if he didn't die behind bars, he had only bleak prospects in the future. I didn't feel sorry for the bastard. He was already old enough to think a bit with his stupid head. I tried not to think about it. But a lonely old age awaited me, which I was very afraid of. I didn't want to be alone, but I understood that I would hardly meet and love anyone. But after some time, fate gave me a gift. I met Kayla. Kayla was my psychologist, whom I started seeing to deal with my problems. Kayla understood me. She had her own unhappy love story. Her husband was a real scoundrel. After some time, we changed the formal setting and started communicating more closely. I felt good with Kayla. She understood and supported me. Our relationship continued to develop, and now we live together. I felt joy again. Kayla filled my emptiness, and now I could smile again. My life continued, and I became happy again. You know, it's been five years since my life situation. And I feel like a perfectly happy person. Maybe it's cruel, but I believe that in life, often events are destined by fate. And no matter how hard you try to change them, it's not always in a person's power. And that's what happened with Mindy. God must have seen it all and realized that she was doomed and would never make it right. But I still don't regret trying to save her. Thank you for listening to me.